Yeah, hello and welcome to the History with Jackson podcast. Today we are talking to Dave Tuck, who's one of the co-authors of the new Pearson Edexcel A-Level US Government and Politics textbooks. And he is also head of politics at Stanford School and an editor at the Politics Review, if I'm right, Dave. So, Dave, where did your interest in politics come from? Um, well, I mean, my background is I, I did a degree in history and politics many years ago. And um, I liked history a lot, as I'm sure obviously you do, because it's history with Jackson. Yeah. Um, but I think I really got into politics um, over history more when it came to dissertation time, because with with history, it's hard to write new because obviously a lot of people have had the history before. But with politics, you can be the first person to analyse an event because it's obviously it's happening right now. So I think I did um, a general election that just happened um, you know, to, you know, to analyse that and, and, and see what was happening because that there weren't lots of historians who'd already looked at it before. Um, but I like the immediacy of politics. With, with, his, with history, you... Um, the event has been looked at sometimes by generations of historians, whereas with politics, you're first on the scene, as it were. So that's probably the attraction, being the first on the scene. And you've really outlined what the difference between history and politics is there. You you can have hundreds Mm. of books on a certain topic, but you could be the first person to write something in politics and no one else could as well. So I I really like that as well. I really enjoy that difference. I think the thing with historians, historians always seem wise and political <laughs> scientists always seem confused, if you know what I mean. Yeah, because definitely. a historian, the event has happened. I mean, um, when you were doing your A-levels, uh, the Battle of Bosworth Field, yeah, Richard III loses every year um, when you're studying it. And lots of people have studied all these events. Uh, and there's a kind of lots of, his, I mean, not all history, but lots Lots of history that's studied, there are now kind of collective wisdoms about what's happened and why it happened and how it happened. Whereas with politics, um, there is there is obviously not a consensus. And lots of times we predict things that are going to happen uh, and then we get them completely wrong. Yeah. And then historians later will tell us why we got them wrong. But uh, it's it's because of the sheer, the sheer complexity of reality makes it difficult to predict what's happening. In the f- Human beings are far less able to predict what's going to happen in the future than they are about explaining what's happening in the past, I think. That is a brilliant line. I think I distinctly remember you going on a couple <laughs> of uh, streaks of predicting incorrectly what was going to happen. <laughs> Definitely. And, I, and in wonderful company as well, <laughs> yes. So I, I, I think I've probably given up predicting events now because it is so difficult. Yeah, I, don't, I don't blame you at all. So your new textbook, if anyone didn't catch it the first time, US government and politics, Um, it looks at the American political system. So for many of our listeners, they're either in the UK or elsewhere, and they don't quite understand the complexities of the US political system. So to give them something to to look at and compare it to, uh, politically, how different is the US to the UK? I think very different, really. Um, I mean, America is still a very young country compared to the United Kingdom. I mean, the, the school I, I work at is older than the, 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 than the United States of America. It, it came into existence before the United States did. We're not even that old in the great scheme of things. Um, I think the big difference between America and the USA is that sovereignty is located within the American Constitution, whereas in the UK, it's located within the UK Parliament. They've got a codified set of rules, many of those uh, which, which are entrenched and are difficult to change. Our constitution is easier to change. Um, their system is much more federal than ours. We, we have got devolution in the system uh, now, obviously, but um, theirs is federal. Um, although we're multicultural, obviously, um, you know, a large part of the population are indigenous, whereas in America, the United States of America, yeah, yeah it's it's not it's a kind of migrant population. Um, 
who've, who've kind of depending on how you look at it have, have taken over the United States. So um, there are big, big differences um, and also political differences in, in the way they view the role of the state as well. We are much, I would say we are much more to let to the uh, as well. That, um, yes. Yeah, that constitution is incredibly important to the Americans and the way they see their life. Um, and you see a huge amount of debate mm. surrounding that. So does that, that make, does that make the US more conservative or right-wing in its political views than other countries? A lot depends on how you, how you describe conservative, really. Um, if, if we look at America in just terms of the state, um, America is, is, is traditionally more smaller state uh, in, in terms of what the state does to help the individual. Um, and in the UK and much of Europe, we're much more bigger state in terms of what the state does to help the individual. Um, so, for example, he- healthcare will be one that I, I would perhaps yeah, use as a, a good figurative example. Yeah, we've had a universal healthcare system since 1945. You know, in, in the USA, you know, they haven't. It's up to the individual a lot more to sort out their own healthcare. And <laughs> it's a big part of work packages over there that you pay for your own welfare, welfare, welfare sorry, healthcare, and you get different types of healthcare, whereas we've got a much more universal equal system, which is obviously quite an expensive thing to do. Um, I think in terms of conservatism, um, um, the big difference, I guess, between the UK and America is um, America is a much more religious country than we are, especially in some states, not in all. Um, And then they have a different attitude to firearms to us as well. Um, But in in many cases, I mean, America is much more... um, can, can, can be more liberal. They've got perhaps a more liberal attitude towards drugs, especially on the East Coast and the West Coast. So um, I would say that you know, they've been the, the forerunners really of you know, LGBTQ+. They've been big on that. So it, it, it's a wonderful hot pot of conservatism and liberalism and social conservatism and, and libertarianism, really. And that's why it's such a fascinating place. And it's it's really interesting to watch it from a distance as we do here to see those views clash because our parties aren't so different as compared no. to the US. So no. if we look at the UK political spectrum, how do these American parties or how would our parties fit into that American system and how would major political figures such as Bernie Sanders and probably Jacob Rees-Mogg fit into those alternative systems? Well, I, I think it's fair. One of the things you have to remember about American politics, and indeed all politics, is that sometimes the participants in American politics and British politics, are they have their belief systems uh, and then they have to frame their policies in terms of what is politically possible at the time. So, for example, I mean, a great example of this would be Mrs. Thatcher. Mrs. Thatcher was much more right wing personally than British politics would allow. So, for example, just take with a lot of people your listeners might be familiar with would be, say, university fees. Mrs. Thatcher would have had students paying their university fees or contribute towards their university fees, you know, when, when she was prime minister. She never did because I think it was politically impossible to pass much more to the left. Um, if we look at the politics and the policies of the, of the parties, uh, and sometimes this, this can, you know, when, when you get people describing Boris Johnson and the Conservative Party as being like very, very conservatives, um, maybe you think that, but in, in American politics, that they would all find themselves in the Democrat Party simply because of their commitment to the NHS. Um, so... Most, I, I think most, a lot of Democrats and a lot of um, Republican, a lot of Democrats especially would be in the Conservative Party. A lot of Conservatives would be in the Democrat Party. There are some exceptions. People like Bernie Sanders, I think, would probably make it to the Labour Party. Um, so would Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. I mean, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez famously said that only in America would she be in the same party as Joe Biden. Um but the parties in America are, are these broad churches. So um, you've got you know, blue dog conservative Democrats on the right of the, conser- of the Democrat Party, like Joe Manchin. And then you've got the more um, 
left wing people on on, on the you know um, so Cortez and 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 uh, Bernie on the left of uh, on the left of the Democrat Party for the Republicans they're much more. Um, it's hard to think of anybody in British politics who could find themselves in the um, Republican Party based on the manifestos of the, of, of the main parties. I mean, maybe some Conservatives would, if given a free hand, um, be um, advocating Republican Party policies. But uh, if, if, any, if the Conservatives tried to run on a Republican Party manifesto, they would lose dramatically in the, in the yeah. next election because the country is to the... Yeah of um, the voters are to, to, to the left in, in Britain than, than, than a lot of the voters are in America. It seems to be in the US that things are a lot more personality driven over the party. Would I be correct in saying that one? Y- yes, um, that is true because I think, um, I, was just, I was just saying before we, we kind of had a technical difficulty there. Um, in the UK, if you're an MP, it doesn't really matter who you are particularly. It's the people are voting for the party. So if you get the constituency, if the constituency says you can stand for them, you are going to win in lots of constituencies, such as my own um, in Stanford. Whereas in America, it's much more personality driven, both at state level for senators and for um, House of Representative uh, members as well. So there's a really big in the UK, in America, they disentangle their elections for their um, for their Congress and for their executive. Um, so personality is really important. The senator is a, a key figure in the state. Uh, House of Representative members are key figures in their district, and it's and in America, when people are voting and the whole process, people are checking on the records of what their congressman or what their senator have done and how successful they've been for their state or their local district. So it's much more personality driven. Lots of people can't name their MP in the UK. They've got a much higher recognition factor in America. Now, we're coming off the back of a Trump presidency, which is has changed American politics for, for good or bad, depending on which side of the spectrum you you lie on uh, precedents have been ignored. So, how has Trump changed that landscape, the political landscape in the US? It's difficult to tell um, at this point. I'm not in history. In, in thirty years' time, when someone's writing the history of this, it would be much easier to answer the question. Going back to our history politics divide, in terms of what change has been made, it's difficult to know whether. The Trump thing is, is is a one-off occurrence, or if it's part of a longer trend with a disenchantment with democracy and politics in America, um, and and the court is out on that. Um, I think the thing that Trump demonstrated, and we've seen it a little bit across the world as well. I mean, Nigel Farage, and and in some ways Jeremy Corbyn too. They had, Jeremy Corbyn has done much in common in terms of politics with Trump or of or Farage, but they've got this thing in common whereby they are articulating to a kind of voter or person that feels disenfranchised, not listened to, ignored. And and, and Trump resonated with a lot of Americans, um, primarily because he didn't speak like a normal politician. You and I are interested in history and we're interested in politics, and we kind of love... We understand the way that politicians talk and, and the messages behind that. For lots of people, it just turns them off. They're not directly answering a question, not saying what they're going to do. And going back to the, the idea of populism, the thing that Trump did, I think, which is very interesting, is he basically said that the problems that America were facing were this, and he had the solutions. And if you voted for him, America would be great again. And he was... Whereas people can you know, can criticise him for being simplistic and uh, unrealistic, uh, he resonated, uh, and it'll be inter- And for me, the interesting thing will be whether the next election we see more of this kind of populist candidates from either the right or the left, um, uh, and whether he stands again. But in terms of whether he changes politics, I don't know. I think the the biggest thing he did 
which I think was concerning was that by throwing the democratic process in doubt, I think he's damaged America's system, whether it's a, a short term thing they can recover from or whether it's long term. There are many people in America who think the election was stolen from Trump, despite there being no evidence of, the, of, the, of, of that being the case. And, and, and that, for me, is a, is a concern for American democracy. And, and going into the, the damaging of the presidency as well, do you think that, do you think that role has changed significantly since Trump's taken over or Biden is repairing that damage? I, I'm not sure that Trump even changed the role of the presidency um, when he was in power, because when he was, when he was president, he found he was frustrated in what he wanted to do, like all presidents before him. Um, he didn't he didn't get his health care policy that he wanted, which is exactly the same as Bill Clinton and exactly the same as Obama. Obama didn't get the, the I mean, Clinton failed it, failed like Trump in getting the health care that he wanted. And Obama had to um, compromise on the health care law that he eventually achieved. And so they, they, all three of them were frustrated in their um, attempts to do what they wanted in terms of foreign policy. Um, Trump didn't get exactly what he wanted. Um, so the Constitution and the separation of powers limits the power of the presidency and limits the autonomy of the presidency. And I felt that Trump, Trump experienced exactly the same problems that everybody else goes through. I think the thing that was unusual about Trump was more his presentation style, um, you know, his stream of consciousness twi twittering, his reliance on social media to bypass traditional media uh, to bypass traditional media was uh, a, a new development, and Biden's returned more to the way everybody else does it. So he's not sitting at two o'clock in the morning um, tweeting, watching Fox News, and, and, and tweeting. Um, he's you know, you, he's been much more traditional in his press conferences. But we must remember that Trump. Trump connected with lots and lots of people who were not interested in politics. Whether we approve of his methods or not, it was an interesting development. But we seem to be returning to a more status quo way of the president behaving, which is a relief for some people. And I think chopping on the foreign policy thing you said there as well, he's he seemed to move slightly differently to some some presidents on that foreign policy term where he's actually spoken to people who are isolated from the international community like Kim Jong-un. So do you think that shows a stronger side to his presidency or a, a different side to say? I think if we look at Trump's presidency overall, he, he one of his longest standing things about um, before he was a politician, even he was talking about this in the 1980s, was that his dislike of America being in supranational organisations like NATO or NAFTA um, or the United Nations. He, he much preferred for America to um, deal in, you know, with countries on a one-to-one -one basis to make deals, but be they trade deals or be they making foreign policy deals. Um, and in some areas, I mean, he's... His unorthodox way of doing things um, you know, bore fruit in a way that other people didn't do. I mean, to give Trump credit, I mean, to sit down with uh, the, the, yeah, the leader of North Korea, to go to North Korea was a, was a good thing. I mean, it, 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 it did look like he was lessening tension. It was incredibly unorthodox the way that he did it. And um, if, if you read um, the accounts of what it was like it was bordering on surreal yeah. their meeting but if obama had sat down with yeah. the leader of north korea he would have been a hero um and, and so perhaps trump deserves some credit for lessening tension with north korea um likewise his handling of the um the immigration crisis um he was successful in um reducing the numbers of people coming to try to enter the united states from its southern border um but of course he he Methods of doing things are, are are not the methods that resonate with you know, with liberals. So in that respect, it comes under criticism. But he wanted everything to be a deal. I mean, and, and he has a point. I mean, from from an American perspective, um, you know, NATO is expensive. 
America is spending a lot more money on its military than anyone in any of the NATO members who uh, are, you know, are barely spending you know, what, they, what they should. America's there to protect um, to you know, protect um, Europe from a Russian invasion, supposedly. And then Germany are doing a deal with gas with the Russians. You know, Trump was right to say, perhaps from an American perspective, you know, what's in it for us? Why are we spending all this money to defend you? All, all these, you know, this deal is from 1945. It's 2021. Maybe you should stand on your own two feet now. And it's interesting that Biden is just as an... Uh, 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 not interested uh, and unsympathetic with the, with the German policy about purchasing gas from Russia. So there are some things perhaps he doesn't get credit for on his foreign policy, but a lot of it depends on where you sit and, wh and where you stand. I mean, um, not a lot of people um, agreed with him pulling out of the, um, you know, the, the, the Tokyo, well, I'm getting it wrong, what it's called now, the, uh, the, the environmental accord the Paris that Accords. we all had with, that's it, the Paris Accord, well done. <laughs> Uh, the Paris Accord, that, that people didn't agree with that, um, and, and he's basically um, sceptical about uh, climate change, people didn't agree with that. But um, yes, th th there were some interesting, th interesting things about his foreign policy, but again, you know, tweeting to the, 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 the leader of North Korea about the size of your nuclear arsenal it, it, it <laughs> is, is not really what people expect from the president um, of the free world and the United States so unorthodox was Donald Trump yeah I think that was a very diplomatic way of putting that across um, <laughs> um so you touched on the liberals <clears throat> sorry you touched on the liberals such as um AOC now where where do you think they're taking the the American political system you know what are they are they changing it or is it just just a phase in American political life where they have a rise in young liberals well, I mean, some, sometimes people talk about the American left as, as if it's a new thing, when in fact, of course, it's, um, you yeah, know, the new left in the 1960s have, have got a lot in common with, you know, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez and um, the left of the Democrat Party now. The big question, of course, is whether people who feel very left-wing uh, in the Democrat Party are, are if we look at, for example, if we look at um, you know, young people in the 1960s, you know, the hippies and you know, the left wing people in the 1960s, um, 60s, you know, they grew up to be quite consistent in some respects. I think the, the big thing for, for, for the new left, uh, yeah, for the left of the Democrat Party, is whether they think they can win the presidency um, or capture up the Democrat Party and move the whole party to the left uh, and still get the seats. And, and, and for me, that's a big doubt. Huge chunks of America are still very conservative. So although Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and her squad are very popular with left-wing media and they really resonate um, across Western Europe. I mean, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is perhaps the most famous member of Congress, I would say, at the moment. She really, I mean, lots of young people find her very inspirational. But whether that's, whether that will translate across America, which is more conservative, I don't know. Um, and as part of a long-term trend, it's going to be interesting to see in the next 30, 40, 50 years, if America becomes more secular, if America um, becomes less religious and less conservative in its more conservative regions. If it does, that would be that would bode well for the left of the Democrat Party. If things continue, continue as, as they have been, um, most Democrat presidents come right of the party or the centre of the party. If you're going to win an election, you have to appeal. You have to appeal to people who might want to vote Republican uh, and who voted Republican last time. And it's difficult to do that if you're on the you know, the far left of, of, of your of, of your party like she is. So she, she speaks well and convinces people who are on her side of the political spectrum to win the presidency. Someone from her part of the party has to convince people in the centre and right of centre in American politics. So that's the challenge for the left of the Democrat Party. It's. It'll be interesting to watch that, definitely considering 
where the US has been and where it was going to go. But we obviously had this this dark moment, this watershed moment in American history, really, on January the 6th with the insurrection. Um, do you think that is emblematic of a wider problem in American society? And what does it mean for the future of American democracy? Um, that's a good question. Whether it was... I personally think that the whole thing was as much a mismanagement of security on the day. I mean, th this was not an organised insurrection in terms of you know regime change. It, it was kind of a... I mean, the beer hall putsch that Hitler organised in 23, whatever it was, was, had, was more organised than, than the, American, um, you know, the, the American insurrection. You had people getting into the Capitol buildings and then it escalated and got out of control. And then very quickly, it, it got out of control. But a, a fire is not organised. Uh, it's spontaneous. It's destructive. People get hurt, but it's not going to take over. There was no real plan to you know, take over the Capitol buildings and, you know, have some kind of a second American revolution. Um, so I, I don't know to what extent that it is important. I think... I think Black Lives Matter and George, the George Floyd um, murder and aftermath to that for me was the, the big event of 2020 along with COVID. Um, but in some ways, I, I look at what happened uh, in, in you know, at the start of the year as, as just being um, almost like an accident, really. So I, I, I don't think it, 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 although it was terrible and embarrassing, I mean, to be fair, it was probably very very embarrassing for american democracy for, yeah, for that to happen but um i'm not sure it's part of a long-term trend really okay so perhaps i'm playing it down no 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 you're the expert so <laughs> that's why you're on well here. I'm, I'm not i, I i'm just I, i'm just a guy with an opinion um you know lots of these things i mean these questions you're asking are very difficult because you're asking um you're asking historians questions. You're asking, you know, what are going to be the, the long-term changes in the future? And anybody, you know, people far more distinguished than me are trying to predict, it's very hard to predict. I mean, I think the big thing going forward for everybody is what's making society stable in both America and the UK and Europe at the moment is that the economy seems to be recovering and doing well. Um, if the economy, if, if we have something like a, the financial crisis of 2009, which, or, or a stock market crash, that could make society much more, you know, much, much less stable. So um, f for me, the big challenge of the next five years is the, on, on, on a political and cultural level is how well things are going economically. If we have a downturn or a deep recession in the next you know, any time in the next five years, that will put a, a huge amount of pressure on everybody in America um, and will make it very difficult. If we, if we have a, a recession or a depression in, in the next, you know, by 2022, that's going to hit, you know, the, the mid, sorry, midterms, midterms in 2022. And of course, 2024, the, you know, the, the, the election of the next president. I mean, before COVID, before Black Lives Matter, Trump was favourite. When I started writing that textbook, Trump was favourite to win um, back second term. So things can change very quickly in politics um, because of variables that haven't happened yet that, that we don't know about. It's events, dear boy, events, if I remember the quote correctly. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now, events, dear boy, events. Now, moving on to your textbook, um, obviously you're very passionate oh, and yes. knowledgeable about your subject. So how did this passion and knowledge lead you into a teaching career and how did that lead you into writing an a-level textbook now to caveat for some of our foreign listeners a-levels are your qualifications that you do when you're 18 uh they're the end of school qualifications yeah well i mean good question um when i was at university i, I continued to master's degree level um and considered doing a phd so I would then have been a lecturer in either history, probably in politics, um, and written journal articles and, and, and books, really, that were designed for 
yeah, high, high study at university and, and degree level. Um, and I got to doing it and I, I found that the bit I enjoyed most is kind of what we're doing now, that the kind of social interaction aspect of talking about politics. Um, and the thought, and if, if, if you're a university lecturer, you know, a, a really big part of your job is producing lots of articles, literally all the time. Um, if you have a publication. Um, and I found myself thinking, well, I, I really fancy the teaching side of, of, of doing that, but I'm not sure I fancy just having, and, and there are, and there is elements obviously where you are teaching, but if you look at lots of university professors, the vast majority of their time is um, writing new material. Um, and writing new material means that you're writing something that no one else has done before. So you're, you're trying to new knowledge to the debate on whatever you're writing about. And that is very difficult to do. So I found myself thinking that I'd be better suited um, into teaching. So for a good 20 years, I taught history. I've been head of history, head of politics, head of politics now at Stanford School, and really enjoyed doing that. And then it was only really in about 2016 that I got into writing, um, having not really thought about doing any writing myself. But the writing I did initially was for Politics Review magazine, so short articles. But going back to the type of writing, the type of writing I'm doing, uh, I'm not really producing what I would call brand new knowledge. I'm producing articles um, and analysis that's designed specifically to help A-level students with their A-level exams. So it's a different style of writing. So I can't, I, I'm working at, the, 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 that's how I got into the writing. And, and I, 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 I'm writing that kind of style or trying to write something that's new and profound on a topic that you're looking at. And it's, it's not always easy to find that, no. even find the topic or the title. And so for me, it's much more straightforward writing. It's much more straightforward writing about something which has got a function of, helping students to answer available questions so that's how i got into it okay that's because i've really enjoyed these textbooks and i think sometimes they're a lot easier to read and gauge an understanding of events than some of these academic books because sometimes you just want that fact as opposed to the opinion yeah. analysis um so from my memory the jump from a level to university yeah. was huge now i went from having everything i needed in one book to having to look in several books um, for a solitary answer. So how does this A-level textbook differ from a university book or a university textbook? Um, well, I mean, I've just, I mean, I've got, um, this is, um, I don't know if, this is, Alec, this is, this is our, my old professor, um, David Mackay, and he wrote American Politics and Society. And this is a, this book really is, if you're doing a first year, second year degree of course you're doing american politics you, you, you'd use that um but you might use mine too there'll, there'll be students that will take their a-level textbooks to, to university with them and you might dip into mine and you've kind of given the answer already a little bit mine will contain a an a-level book is a kind of mixture of knowledge facts analysis and evaluation but in my textbook, if you can't remember what the 10th amendment is, you can look it up in the textbook. If you can't remember exactly how you, how you change the constitution, you can look it up in the textbook. So it, it, it's a nuts and bolts of how things work and why they work that way. Now, this, this is interesting if you're an A-level student, but if, if you're a degree level student, the kind of debates you're doing are much more complex because you know, you're, looking, you're looking at it in a much more detailed way. So, the, if you're looking at, um, looking at a broad textbook, like an A-level, uh, a degree-level textbook, there'll be more analysis and evaluation in it. But, but even then, as, as you probably found out yourself, you'll probably look at my book and then the, the A-level, the degree-level textbook as the first thing you look at, just to remind yourself the kind of rules of the game. Um, but then, in the, then you'll have to move to a journal article. Um, or a, a brand new book that have some of them in, but at a much simpler level, because I'm writing at the level below 
um, the level that you're working at a degree level. Um, so probably if, if anyone took my book to university with them, it would be like, oh, I can't remember. Before I start analysing why the constitution is so hard to change, let's just have a quick look and see how it all works. Perfect. And, and then and you, and you wouldn't even probably reference my book in, in, a, in, a, in a degree essay. You, you, you go straight to the, you know, the, the experts, as it were, who were just writing pure analysis and pure evaluation with hardly any bothering about the facts and stuff and obviously sources play a part in that as well uh you know university make sure you use a variety of different sorts primary and secondary so how do sources play a role in you writing your textbook well i mean it's interesting you mentioned sources because on this textbook i mean something anthony bennett feels strongly about and we took it to a new level um Lots of textbooks for an A-level will not reference sources directly um, for students. So they might do a bit at the back, but this time we've, each chapter's got bibliographies to try and replicate the experience that a first year degree student would have where the bibliography is a really important thing. If you don't cite where you got your information from, um, you're, you're, you're kind of in trouble. I mean, for me, writing this textbook, um, I use lots and lots of secondary sources um, <coughs> to help me write the the content. Um, some of it, some of, the, some of them was a bit of it was history. So there's a, there's, a, there's a new section that I wrote in the chapter on the presidency about the Bill Clinton presidency. So I had to get some books on Bill Clinton to look at. Um, and there was lots of it on Trump, lots and lots of books on Trump. The last edition didn't really cover the Trump presidency at all because he just got in. So we looked at lots of Trump stuff. Um, there was a little bit of primary, which was very unusual um, for a textbook like this, because things kept, ha things kept happening during the writing of the book. I mean, COVID hit just at the start. We had the Black Lives Matter thing. We had... Um, the insurrection, the Capitol building invasion, and the second impeachment. And then what else did we have? Oh, yeah. And then I had to analyze the Trump presidency. And of course, nobody had written anything on it because it was so recent. So I was using some first primary sources to do that as well. But most of it was secondary sources I was using. So, I mean, going back to the, the book, there is new knowledge in here, I suppose, but essentially, it's, this is like a, a massive, you know, this is like a massive literature review, really. Um, you, so although this is as long as a PhD, it, it yeah. wouldn't work as a PhD. If you added this in as a PhD, um, if a PhD, because there's there's not a thesis, there's, uh, there's not a hypothesis, there's not a, a, something new that I'm trying to discover. It's, it's a generalised guide for the American system. So with a, a little bit of groundbreaking oh, yeah. analysis as well <laughs> and um yeah I, I did there was a little bit i mean there was a bit on the bridge uh so on the wall the so there's a bit in the book where i i had to work out to what extent the wall was a success so i had, I had a week where i was just looking at the the wall and and, and and the amount of cement and the amount of fencing it was a surreal thing and i actually had to do a diagram of the wall and things uh, and that was perhaps the only new bit that um the primary stuff i was using to do that but other than that no so you're on the cutting edge of uh american wall research there you go dave <laughs> yes <laughs> um and then obviously there's a specification so you've not just written this and gone out and gone, oh, right, all about this. There's a specification or several specifications that you have to cater your writing for. So how much does this, this specification play a role in your writing? It's, it's everything, really. I mean, the specification is like the skeleton of the book. Um, and I say this sometimes to the students. Um, we, we're not studying American politics. We're studying... Pearson, Edexcel, A-level American politics. So we're looking at what the exam boards see is the most important aspects of American politics, and that's what we're focusing on. Uh, sometimes this can be controversial, not so much with America, say with political ideas, um, which we study now. Some people will say, I think these key thinkers are more important than these key thinkers. And I say, well, that's very interesting, but the spec says this, we, we must stick to the spec. 
So the spec is God um, and it's very, very important. And so this textbook is designed to hug the spec. Uh, I want a teacher or a student to open up their, look at their specification, the exam spec, which they'll probably get a copy of or it's online and open the textbook and then, and then every section matches. It makes it so much easier. Sometimes you get textbooks where authors are a bit liberal with the spec. So it's all there, but it's, it's, it's the order's not clear to the student. And I think for a student and a teacher, they want it so it matches. So the spec's everything, really. Okay. And then you've also written other textbooks. You've written the Political Ideas textbook, uh, and you also write your articles for Politics Review. Does this, the writing for this text, textbook differ yeah. in terms of that? Yes, it was much harder. It was, it was it's the hardest, it's probably the hardest thing I've ever done. I found this harder than doing, you know, master's degrees, really, dissertations. I mean, I think the hardest thing is political ideas is a little bit like history in the sense that the political ideas don't change that much. The only political idea that's really evolving, really, I would say that we're doing at the moment is feminism. You know, conservatism, socialism, they're pretty fixed. You know, Karl Marx hasn't written anything new lately. Neither is Edmund Burke. <laughs> it's much more straightforward to do it because it's, 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 it's done. It's settled. Whereas what made this book so difficult to do was as we were writing it, it was in one of the most event-filled years in recent history. We had the COVID-19 crisis. We had the... Um, Black Lives Matter, George Floyd movement. We had the second impeachment. We had a country in turmoil. Um, and it made it very difficult to write. We, we kept having to go back to things we, we thought we'd finished and then change them again. So we'd written quite a lot of the book and then Black Lives Matter happened. I had to go back and change certain bits in previous chapters. It changed the civil rights chapter, obviously, quite a lot because it was a, a new development. Um, the second, the book was, it had been checked, proofed, getting ready to go to, a, to approval by Edexcel. And then the Capitol buildings um, invasion happened. The second impeachment happened. We had to wait, wait for the second impeachment to happen and then go back oh. into all five chapters of the book and make corrections because obviously new events had happened. I mean, I was still adding that we were trying to add things right until the last minute with Joe Biden as president. But it, it was a very difficult book. It was also a very difficult book to write in lockdown um, because obviously my working life had changed. And I mean, this this time last year I was writing it and it was just it was a stressful thing to do. I, we found it. It was hard, but it was great to finish. Uh, but it was it, it, it was a. It was just a, a big thing to do, given all all the change happening, writing it, and all the change in in my lifestyle, doing the work. If you know what I mean. So you've obviously looked at the the parts of the book which are the most difficult to write, and how difficult the process was, uh, and it must be a massive relief to actually see the book and feel the book in your hands. But which part of the process did you enjoy the most? Uh, I think writing about the presidency, um, and I think I enjoyed it the most because. Trump is such a different president to everybody else. And he was so unorthodox. And there were some wonderful stories. I mean, a lot of the stories didn't make the book because although they were funny and they were funny and interesting, um, they weren't really the kind of thing you, that would help you answer an A-level question. It was great to get, it would be good to get students interested in it, but maybe not for answering an essay question. Um, so what's good about Trump is students writing essays on him uh, and the president you've got lots of exam boards love you to show differences between different presidents and sometimes it's quite hard because the difference in the president is perhaps quite subtle but it's made, it can be easier for someone who doesn't really follow the rules but um I, I just I enjoyed writing about him. I also enjoyed just learning myself just how what's the word I'm looking for when I say diplomatic. Um, 
but I can't. Chaotic the White House was in, in the four years that he was there. So it was incredibly interesting to, to, um, you know, to research and then to write about, really. So that's the bit I like best. Yeah, it's definitely and I think been... also, to be fair, there's certain bits. I think the thing that's interesting about the thing about writing a textbook from a teacher's point of view is when you use a textbook yourself, you find yourself thinking, oh, why didn't they do it like this? Why didn't they do it like that? I, I wish they had done that. So there were various things that I've always wanted to do in terms of looking at American politics. And it's very satisfying to change the textbook. So it's essentially something I, I can use myself as a teacher. So there was just, there was just one thing, say, on executive orders, which I'm not sure if, if you remember when I taught executive orders. Um, but I did a whole page on executive orders, different types of executive orders, ones that worked, ones that didn't. And I put ticks and crosses next to them. And I just thought that would be a really useful thing for teachers and students. So that's probably the, that was probably the page of the whole book I was happiest with. I'm not sure how innovative it was, but in terms of the way it was presented, so I think one of the things that's very useful, I'm not, I should really give credit to um, my editor, Beth Hutchins, who was fantastic working with me, is that when you're writing these things, you've got to try and present it in a way that makes the student, that's easier for the student to understand what it is you're trying to get across. So I was very happy with the way we presented it. It's very interesting watching that chaos uh, develop in the White House and and, be, and you being able to write about it and actually someone be able to understand it and write an exam question sounds absolutely amazing. And there's definitely some stories you probably weren't allowed to mention. <laughs> uh, but having that ownership of being able to write something that aids your own teaching must be really rewarding as well. Um, because I remember, it is. I remember if, if everyone hasn't already caught on before, they've taught me at A-level. So there were there was probably some resources that you'd drawn on the whiteboards <laughs> that you probably in, included in your in your books so it must be great for you to see yeah. those yes it is yeah it, it, it is it, it, it's um it, it is nice uh i think the thing at times it could be scary though because um sometimes you're writing the book and you're sitting there trying to write i mean you, you've written essays yourself yeah and the only person that will read your essay will be your professor or the person marking it and sometimes I was right I'd be writing I'm thinking oh my gosh this time next year there'll be teachers and students looking at this and they, they need it to be good because they want to write an essay on it and, and you also kind of almost get a kind of stage fright it's like wow this is a big deal I mean there's, there's a whole section in the book that is on the spec that wasn't really covered before on um, how successful presidents since 1993 have been and I was conscious that what I was writing will end up being the mark scheme <laughs> for how Pearson and Excel end up doing it because it was essentially what, what, what my opinion was. And, um, and that was quite daunting. But whenever I had issues where I was a bit, you know, I, I was a bit concerned about something or, you know, what do you think of this? I, I had people I would talk to. So I, I've got some, fr- I've got my, one of my best friends is a professor of politics. I, I spoke to him. I spoke to my co-authors. So it, 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 I, I never felt I was winging it, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but yes, it's, it, 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 it is nice. It is nice to do. And then working with your co-authors, uh, Anthony J. Bennett and Simon Lemieux, if I'm saying that correctly, how did you three decide uh, on Lemieux, what areas... Simon oh, Lemieux. Lemieux. Sorry, Simon. Um, how did you three decide on what areas yes. that you wrote on? Because obviously you've all got different areas of specialism. Well, I did the, the way the book the, the book. I mean, you you, you studied the Anthony Bennett book when you did A level politics, I think. Um, and the, 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 well, I'll quickly go for the history of the book. But the, the book in its last edition was written for an Edexcel AQA audience. So there's two exam boards for A level, uh, and you did Edexcel when you were a student with me. Um, but the problem was with Edexcel and AQA. Although it's very similar, there are areas of difference between the two specs. So Anthony had to cover both, but it made the book a bit unwieldy. And sometimes there were issues with teachers teaching bits of the spec 
that we were not on their spec. You had students panicking because I think when, well, no, you, you were the last year of the old spec. When I was teaching it <coughs> the first time through on the new spec, kids were saying, you're not covering this. It's in the textbook. And I go, ah, oh, but that's on the, on the other course. And it made kids a bit jumpy. So they wanted a book that was just at Excel. But Anthony is now, I mean, Anthony's been writing books for over 30 years, and he didn't want to write the new edition. So we took the old edition, and then I basically rewrote and reorganised all of it. Um, so I was basically the person in charge of doing that. And then we got to the point where it was so, because it was such a new, usual year with Black Lives Matter and COVID and everything else and, and, and there were a few issues um, obviously with teaching online as well. It got to about August, September time and I said and by this point I was doing another book uh, I've got another book that's coming out so I, I was doing that and I said I could do with a bit of help in um Proof. The whole thing was written, but we need to go back and edit and proof and add bits and take bits out. And, and we were also having to wait for the 2020. So, so we had to basically wait for the 2020 election. Um, so I asked, I said, can we have somebody else come in and help? Because it's, it, it's a lot of this. And Simon came in, and Simon's very good on elections. So Simon came in and did the 2020 election stuff. And then he tidied up the Supreme Court and civil rights sections. Um, he added a few case studies. So that's kind of how we did it. And Nancy would check each chapter and say, well, I like this, or I'm not keen on that. And we talk about that. We, a lot of things are just done presentation. Um, a big part of the difference between um, a degree textbook or a degree work that you look at is you just write paragraphs. Whereas with a level uh, textbooks. You've got the content, and then it's like, well, how do you translate this content? So, um, people like I mean, a, my two editors I've worked before, Emily Wells, who's brilliant from Harder, and uh, Beth Hutchins from Harder as well. They might say, "This is a brilliant section. You've written it brilliantly. Could you put it in a table?" Oh. And you go, "Oh, okay." Or could you present it? Could you present it in a different way? Or could you break it up? It's usually, can you break it up? You put it into bullet points. So they're really good because you, you know it's yourself. You're so into the content, and, and that's the main thing. But then you get these brilliant people who look at it and say, well, let's just take that content and make it more accessible by presenting it in a different way. So we and, and, and Beth, Beth and stick on, on this book. Yeah, we're wonderful in giving advice on that. I'll be there going, you really want me to do it at the table? Because I've finished it now. Yes, do it at the table. Okay. <laughs> that's another brown art. Well, that's, that's actually quite interesting to learn how it's all done um, and the actual work that goes into it. Because I just, I just see the book and think, oh, that's wonderful. But to know that it's potentially twice as long is actually quite amazing to know that. And as we do here on History of Jackson, we always recommend books and we ask fun questions for our podcast guests. So for US politics students of all ages and levels, um firstly what would you recommend they do and which three books would you recommend that they go away and look at i think if you're a um i think if you're in if, if you're a kind of general newcomer to politics um you could just try a, a general history of, of american politics going right the way back to the civil war and the constitution but I've had to be broad brush, but the book I like is it's quite a modern book. It takes you from history, uh, America from 1974 up to the present day. It's called Fault Lines, a history of the United States since 1974 by Kevin Cruz and Julia, Julian Stelizer. Uh, that's it, Z E L I Z E R. And that's that's a really good book because it's it's, it's, it's quite broad because obviously you're looking at 50 years of history nearly, um, but there's lots of high level evaluation in there too. So I, I, I looked at this book and, and there's, there's quotes and analysis from these two, these two high level, where are they from? They're two 
professors from um, Princeton University. You can't get much better than that. Can no. <laughs> These two great professors from Princeton. Um, yeah, they're far more distinguished than I am, and I'm taking their cutting edge analysis and popping in the book. That, that's a great book to start on. Um, if you're interested in presidency, um, I mean, I've got a book here um, American Carnage on the Front Lines of the Republican Civil War. That's by Tim Alberta. That's a great book on trying to understand what's happened to Republicans and the rise of Trump. Um, but it's it's what interests you about American politics, really. I mean, it's, it's like a hydra's head. There's so much to it. Um, yeah, there's lots, lots and lots of things that you can look at. There's, there's a, I'll, I'll name one other book I haven't got with me. Um, it's called Development in American Politics, is the title. If you put that into an Amazon page, you'll get it. It's edited by Julian Peel of Oxford University. And that looks at the broader elements of American politics and society. And and will write you how well, what's happened since the last book. So that they're currently developing politics eight, which takes you up to Trump. Um, developing politics nine will be coming out fairly soon. And I used the last book um, to help me write my um, textbook because it's got some great stuff. But it's, it's pure evaluation. So, but it's still very, very accessible. So that's what I get. That's what I would do. Oh, brilliant. And if I was interested in reading. Something. And the Amazon links for all of these books will be in the description of the podcast or the video on YouTube. So you can get them yourselves if you're really interested in getting them. And then for your final fun question, as we do for all our guests, I know you're a big Wolverhampton Wanderers fan. So if you had three favourite players from the team, past and present, who would they be? Well, if I take three players from um, my, my time. I mean, I, um, what happened to Wanderers were when I was um, at school, we were a very poor team. We'd, we'd gone down to the bottom league. So, as a student, we were relegated four times, three or four times. It's very difficult being a Wolves fan at school. Um, it was so bad, no one even took the mickey because you know, we were beyond the criticism. We just are oh, four old Wolves. But there's a, a guy called Steve Bull was the striker for us in the late 80s. And he helped Wolves get up into the what is the championship now. He played for England about 13 times. And he's a cult hero for most um, you know, in football. But he's not the best striker I've had. But anybody my age, he means a lot because you know, he, he, he reignited hope in, in the Wolves fan base. So I'm a big fan of him. I mean, of the current team, I'm probably... That's my big fan. Of. I'd probably like Adam Triora, who is hopefully going to stay with us, but he may be going somewhere else. <laughs> I like him because he's an incredibly fast, powerful winger. He's the kind of player that when he gets the ball, you're up on your feet because he's so fast and he's uh, so quick. So I think he's a fantastic player. And, and I'd probably like uh, another player called Matinho, who's a midfield player. He's 35. But I think he's just a consummate professional, but also he's such a good pastor of the ball and such a good leader. So I like him. So British player from the old days and Portuguese player and a Spanish player are my favourite. <laughs> but thank you for asking me those questions. That's all right. It's always a Portuguese player at Wolves, isn't it? So, <laughs> well, it's very Portuguese. <laughs> and if anyone listening to this wants to find you online, read any more, more of your work or keep up to date with you, where can they find you? Um, I'm, if you put my name into um, Amazon, I'm there, um, David Tuck. I, I tweet a lot um, at Mr. Tuck, 2013. Um, I tend to just retweet stuff. I, I don't, I'm not a participant, you know what I mean. I, I'm, I'm more an observer. So I try and tweet things from all different sides of the political debate. So students can see all sides of the arguments. I don't want it to be an echo chamber. So Sometimes I get people criticising me, going, why are you tweeting left-wing stuff or why are you tweeting right-wing stuff? Which because that's what politics is. Um, and I'm on Instagram, because lots of younger people are on Instagram, I've got an Instagram account called at Mr. Tuck Politics, it's called, um, which is a mixture of, 
I put in you know, pictures and things. Of, uh, it, it's, it's, it's less um, less intensive as visual account. There's lots of politics on there as well. But also a few bits of bobs at my school. So those are two places where I I kind of hang out in the digital social media world. So, so I will out. put Dave's Instagram and Twitter and his Amazon page in the description so you guys can keep up to date with him. Well, thank you very much for coming on, Dave. I really appreciate it. And it's great to catch up with you again. And I look forward to your new book coming out.